Welcome to uh, the first, key, uh, first post keynote hangover of the DockerCon. Um, you know, great keynote. I thought there was a lot of good things that I would have been complaining about in my uh, deck today that, you know, uh, Solomon did a very good job of, you know, cutting off at the knee. So, you know, as you would expect, I, I imagine the only place that would be worse is if you were at reInvent when half the vendors go out of business after the keynote. Um, but let, let's get on with it. Um, my name's Jim Ford. I work for Automatic Data Processing. Uh, we are the quote unquote largest global provider of human capital management software. We have about 630,000 clients, about $11 billion in revenue. So you can see we're a small startup. Uh, very green field, no, no legacy whatsoever. Oh, I'm sorry, we call it traditional now? Is that the rule? Traditional code versus legacy. I'm sorry, I'm legacy, so it's legacy. Uh, we do business in about 120 countries. We have about 5 million logins a day. Um, it's a complex environment. You know, we have a lot of very complex stuff. We have a lot of awards. We just won the 2017 award on uh, financial fortunes most admired companies to work for. Um, so if you need a job, you know, we have postings, feel free, and uh, we do Docker. Um, what do we do? We do hire to retire. Um, you know that horrible performance assessment you had earlier this year where your boss told you you were doing great or doing horribly? Well, that was probably on software we might have provided. You know, don't blame the software. It's not our fault that you got a bad appraisal. It's your boss's fault. Uh, you might have gone through um, benefits enrollment. You might have gone through, oh, almost anything. Your 401k might be with us. Uh, you might have been, uh, your screen and selection and your background check might have been through us. So. We like to think we're the business behind the business. We help drive the human capital management adoption where you know, companies realize that human capital is truly the main thing they have. ADP has what I like to call grown up challenges. Uh, we have multiple legacy code bases. See, I didn't say traditional. Uh, we have numerous versions running concurrently in production. Not because we want to, mainly because we have those pesky things called clients. And clients don't necessarily want to upgrade on our time frame. They want to upgrade on their time frame. And obviously some upgrades are more disruptive to the client than others. So it's difficult for us to move everybody quickly together. So we end up with what I like to call acquisition-induced multi-architecture syndrome. You buy things for a lot of reasons. And you justify that you bought them because the technology fits in with your landscape. And typically, the clients don't really fit, but you work it out and you figure out where you can get shared services, where you can get things uh, folded in into a more rational and coherent fashion. Uh, we do end up with a certain amount of urban sprawl, unfortunately. So we have redundant services. We have redundant um, code. You know, we have, I don't know, 20 log services running for 50 apps and we sit there and complain, why don't we have one log service? And as soon as you talk to somebody about when you're going to move to our log service, you get 120 reasons why there's 50 stories that are more important than the one you want. So, you know, one of our main goals is to try to figure out how to get more code to production faster. So we try to work on creating developer velocity. And Docker has really helped us on that in terms of making it so that we get a lot more through the pipeline more quickly and anything that makes our deployment easier and our nightmare from hell weekends after deploying, you know, those three-day triage calls when you figure out, okay, who fat fingered the config and why, um, those go away very relatively quickly and they're helping us out in a lot of ways. Uh, in ADP's first year, we started out back in 2015 whiteboarding about how great it would be to do something better we spent more time than we would like in New York talking to Pivotal about Cloud Foundry, and we got to learn what opinionated stacks really are. In many cases, they're too opinionated for a shop that has traditional code. Uh, it's great if you're Greenfield and you can go na cloud native, but we are not cloud native people. We are cloud immigrants, and we do not want a wall built between the cloud native and the cloud immigrant. So beware of those cloud nativists. They're great if you're Greenfield starting out with nothing, they're not your friend if you have any legacy code whatsoever. You will end up in the bad place trying to go ahead and rebuild it. We had some folks at DockerCon in 2015, a couple folks, I think a couple of them are in the room. 
Um, good times. You know, we moved on. We went through our architectural review process. And just so you know, I am part of the enterprise architecture team here. Uh, I'm a little bit unusual in that respect because I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. That's the typical EA approach. We've got to get past that. I think it was uh, Brian Cantrell at Container Summit made the point that if you wait for technology to get to where you're comfortable with it, you're probably late. So you got to kind of run a little faster than you're used to. You got to be a little bit uncomfortable. It's probably healthy for you, but it's that uncomfortable kind of healthy. Uh, we moved on. We started playing with OpenStack and Docker. You know, after all, Docker's not safe, so you have to go ahead and contain it somehow. So we contained the containers on VMs and sat there scratching our heads going, is this a step forward? Um, we then got to a proof of concept. Our original proof of concept was what I would call an adjacent service, a nice small microservice that worked to accept what are called tax resolution notices uh, from our mobile app. Uh, basically, if you're working, if you're a company that does business with ADP, you might be using our tax filing service. It's one of the things that a lot of small companies like because we indemnify you if we screw up your taxes and we're on the hook. So employers from 50 to about 3,000 tend to like that a lot because it lets them sleep at night. Well, every now and then this little letter shows up from the taxing authority saying, you paid us $3 and we think you owe us 5 uh, and there's a resolution that has to be worked out. In the traditional process, that came to us via snail mail, via fax, via email, uh, via a letter, you know, Pony Express, a hundred different ways we would get these things. And they would always come in with some client name on them that we could not readily map back to the actual client in our systems. And it would cause us to go through a lot of manual effort to go ahead and do stuff that was not really adding value. So by moving this into the mobile app and making this nice containerized image capture service, we could capture the logged in user from the mobile app. We could capture the context around the user who was giving it to us. We could respond back to them more appropriately, more quickly, and we could reduce the burden of what we had to do manually. So a win-win, right? Everything's a win. Uh, last June, we saw my former boss, Keith Fulton, up on the stage talking about Chicken McNuggets and ice cream. He pointed out, we have chickens, we want Chicken McNuggets, and mercifully he didn't go into how you make Chicken McNuggets out of chickens, although I was a little disappointed. I think everybody else in the room was grateful. And then he went on to his second analogy where he discussed how we have functionality like big vats of ice cream, and we like to scoop them out into little containers called cones. Um, I'm not going to be quite as food focused in my metaphors. I'm going to take you on a ride around the globe once on the space shuttle because I like space more than I like uh, ice cream and McNuggets. I know you're all disappointed, but we'll move on. Uh, at the show last year, we announced that we were one of the flagship partners running Docker Data Center. And we have basically been running Docker Data Center ever since. And generally, we're happy with it. It's taking us a long way. If you think about it, you have a balancing act that goes on in any of these platforms. It's how much engineering do you want to do versus how much do you want to go ahead and get done. So you can spend the rest of your life building from first principles and get stuff done yourself, or you can go ahead and buy into a, a Docker data center or a Kubernetes or a Joy and Triton or a, oh, a Mesosphere and you get a certain amount of lift because they've done a lot of that for you. And they are still opinionated, but they're not quite as opinionated as those cloud nativists with their 12-factor pension. So you can go ahead and break the 12-factor barrier and say, well, I'm not really 12-factor, but I still want to get the benefit of containers. And let me assure you there are benefits even for monoliths. So where are we now? Well, we've reached the point where we have Docker more or less everywhere. We have Docker on VMs, we have Docker on mainframes, we have Docker on bare metal, we have Docker on-premise, we have Docker in the cloud, we even were part of the Azure demo, uh, beta where we have Docker running Windows containers for us. Um, on the mainframe, we have good, we have bad, we have a nice supported Docker engine, we're still waiting on Docker to deliver some other functionality to make it a managed node so it can participate properly in Docker data center, but we'll get there and, you know, the more you're out of the mainstream, the more you have to wait for them to catch you up. So, 
Believe it or not, Linux on mainframe is not all that mainstream. I know you're all shocked because you're going to go home to your mainframe and log in. Um, in November of 16, we had um, 600 engines and about 1,000 containers running. And we thought we were, you know, going good and pushing along. But we've pushed even harder. And now in April, you know, now, we're down to 469 engines, but we're up to nearly 4,000 containers. So I could tell you this is because of great enhancements to Docker, but I'll tell you that it's really just because we've started to step away from some of the VMs. We've gotten bigger VMs. We've gotten better packing ratios. We've gotten to where we're using some bare metals, which are helping to erode the number of engines we need. So you can't take this as a direct thing of saying, oh, Docker's three and a half times more efficient. It's we're just three and a half times more aggressive in the hardware we're putting underneath it more so than the efficiency we're getting from them. Um, today in our DTRs we have a little over 9,000 unique images. Um, those images are so large in number primarily because we have a lot of applications that have shifted into the CI-CD flow where we're starting to build on check-in and get unique images that are immutable, built, and then pushed through the rest of the build chain using Jenkins and other tooling to help us get that traceability. You know, it's really, you know, getting the developer back into a flow state where we can get the developer to realize that that fat finger on the keyboard really did cause the build to break. You know, they don't, you don't want to wait a week or two weeks for this whole big compile to occur and tell me, oh, you have a bug in what you did two weeks ago. I'm lucky if I remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, much less two weeks ago. So, you know, you really need to get that immediate feedback, and I think that's one of the great things that Docker's allowed us to do, is get more immediate feedback. And if I can get to the next slide. So, you know, how did we get here? In a lot of cases, you'll find enterprise architecture teams try to push technologies onto teams. They try to say, thou shalt use X or thou shalt use Y. And usually the adoption's very difficult because the devs know better and they don't want to hear your crap about why this is the right answer. It may be the right answer, but they're not buying it. So we find that a pull works a little bit better. And in our case, the developers were really kind of itching to get Docker into a place where they could use it more robustly and get to where they could move it through the chain more readily. And it was an interesting balance because in theory, we could have done some of this back in the VM world, but the VMs were too fat to push and the VMs had too many internal dependencies where you still had to log into the VM, you still had to go and change things. So Docker helped a lot in getting us where we needed to go with dependency injection and other things that make life possible in the modern world. Uh, it helped us get our developers into what I would call more of a flow state, where they could actually work continuously and not context switch out and become, okay, I'm coder now, I'm sysadmin now, I'm troubleshooter, I'm back to coder. They kind of stay in that coding mindset while they work through and get that immediate feedback. There's a lot of concern also around the security space where a lot of the vendors that you'll hear from as you go through your conference and talk about how to secure the Docker ecosystem are generating an awful lot of noise. They're generating a lot of data that's then being fed somewhere, but it's not always the signal. And I keep talking to these startups that are in the security space about how do you invent the Dolby noise reduction for security software? I don't want to know there's 10,000 events flowing by. I want to know there's 10 I care about and this is what they mean. You know, I want somebody to take a look at my compose and know that based on how I'm using something, I don't care about heart bleed on my database server. I don't expose SSL there. Why, why are you telling me this is important when it's not? And that's really one of the things I'm hoping to see as the maturity comes to the community where we'll get more and more higher level data out of the application and they'll be able to tell us when, I ma when it matters. I think that part of what Solomon said earlier today about the shrink to fit the minimal container is huge because there's 20 plus million lines of code in Linux today. 20 million lines of code. Now, I'm old enough to remember when you just ran command.com and then put your stupid application there, and that was good enough. You know, one file, not 20 million lines of code. 
I personally believe that a lot of the security vulnerabilities we see today come from all that drag-along code because the developers have gotten more or less lazy. They no longer understand what's really running on the metal. They understand what they're doing up with their IDE, and their IDE says that these 73 things are co-recs and pre-recs that get dragged in, and, you know, secret hacker library number 99 is now a co-rec that got sucked in here, and you're going, but I don't need it, and you're right, you don't need it. So hopefully this shrink-to-fit kind of thing that they're talking about this morning will help us reduce the surface area and do it in a way that's transparent to the devs in a way they'll be able to consume it versus having to go educate them all on, oh, you need this library and that library requires this one and doing dependency management in a hard, difficult kind of a way. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to do what I would call agile enterprise architecture, you know, how to run with scissors safely. Hopefully we're getting there, uh, otherwise we're gonna get cut. I would implore you to avoid unnecessary complexity. Well, what makes it unnecessary? Well, that's the challenge, isn't it? You've got to figure out for yourself what gives you lift versus what gives you drag. So, you know, you don't want to box yourself into too many proprietary solutions. We go back to that opinionated thing. You don't want to get trapped into something that only one vendor can supply and one vendor can support. You know, one of the things I really like about Docker is tomorrow if Docker has a problem and I can't use Docker Data Center anymore, I can pivot and run those same containers on Joyance Triton, I can pivot and run them on Kubernetes, I can pivot and run them on Mesosphere, and all of my investment in building those container images and building all that software is preserved. That said, I'm staying with Docker Data Center as far as Docker Data Center will take me, and until they cause me to have to pivot, I'm good. You know, so really you need to think about standards being your friend, I think the graphic is kind of good in that respect. You know, the SpaceX guys and the Dragon capsules all rely on that standard docking ring that was built in and agreed upon by both the Russians and the United States. So a Soyuz can go ahead and dock to the space station just like an Apollo could have or any other spacecraft we had. So think about the big standards that are going to make your stuff fit together and stay away from getting too marginalized or too complex just for your own um, reasons. Uh, don't limit your toy box, you know. There are cases where the orchestrator is going to matter more than some other piece. You may want to go ahead and, and play with Docker Enterprise, Docker Community Edition, go on and look, and look at others, see what Kubernetes does for you, see what Joyent can do for you, see what Mesos can do for you, and then keep the tools that actually resonate with your shop. You know, you don't want to start out by saying, we're going to be a X shop because I said so. You want to get enough experience to know why it matters and where you want to be. So, you know, go with what works for you. Don't get too caught up in the religious war. Um, there's a whole process around getting people to adopt this, especially in a Fortune 100 company. We have a very large group called our Global Security Organization, or as I like to refer to them, the people who are paid to be professionally paranoid. Um, they're a thorn in our side, there's no question. We could run faster and go further if we didn't have their concerns about what does being in Docker mean. And I think some of the stuff that came out of this morning's keynote will help assuage some of their fears. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to where we can comfortably run software we've taken from Docker Hub or taken from a public repository and run it in our hosting center as trusted and available. And, you know, you can see that can be a little bit of a problem because even if Docker certifies it as being safe and effective, uh, a company with 290 or 320 people uh, versus 57,000 people and $11 billion, uh, I'm not risking $11 billion on Docker telling me it's safe. We need extra assurance. We need to prove it to ourselves. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to a world where we have our pre dit environment being open and available so the developers can take what they need from almost any source within reason. We're going to whitelist the sources. We're not going to let them download from some random library in Eastern Europe that contains great new helpers for JavaScript or whatever. God knows what they really do. And the goal is that when the code has been tested and, and validated far enough that the developer wants to push it into our integration testing, 
that we would then go through a rebuild from first principles and go through a black duck scan for license and compliance, um, check this stuff into an artifactory so we're building from our own sources, not from external sources, and then automate it where you would also check in your, your Jenkins scripts into Bitbucket so that no human has to touch anything above the pre-dit environment. In a perfect world, we want automation to do everything in the pre-production environments all the way up to the prod gateway. And then we want a big red button that says deploy, that says yes, this is certified and we're happy. And part of that is part of why I complain to the security vendors a lot, is I need a way to tell what's changed from a security posture release to release. I want to get to where I have kind of a random score and it could be arbitrary, you know, this week we deploy X product with a score of 50, next week the release is a 55, okay. Is, a five, is, a, is five points of difference enough to force a manual pen again? Today I have a policy that requires manual pen testing before release to production. So that's two weeks of manual effort being introduced into an automated build pipeline. Somehow they don't quite match up on what you want versus what you're getting. So the more we can surveil this intermediate zone of untrusted but known software, the more we can get to where we can make that educated decision on what gets released automatically versus what requires the manual validation. And then the goal is to get so everything in production is trusted, it's signed in notary, it's got everything it needs so we can only run certified and signed images, so we have confidence with the 630 clients worth of data and the 80 plus million social security numbers we manage. Unless all you guys want free credit monitoring from us, I think it's a good plan. Um, so containers do work for monoliths. You know, Solomon made the point this morning that we do now see people putting things that don't belong in containers in containers. Quite honestly, that's kind of where we started was putting things that don't belong in containers in containers. There's a lot of benefits you get from doing that in the build and commit semantic and the deploy semantic. I would much rather deploy one image and run 40 copies than wait for 40 VMs to spin up and run the tarball and uninstall and everything else. It's much cleaner, much more scalable, much easier. Um, you really need to get to where you automate everything back to the point where you don't use manuel if you can avoid manuel. Um, you know, you can't really force conformity too early. You know, right now we build public and run private. We may eventually flip to where we build private and run public. Who knows? But the key here is to remember that a lot of these things around automating and getting good unit tests and getting to where you're hands off are also the prereqs to get to public cloud. If you're in public cloud and you're still doing manual deployment, you're not going to be very happy in the public cloud for very long. So there's a lot of those 12 factor things that are still there that kind of lurk that are still best practices and still good to attain, but if you get to eight of them, you're good, as long as you're running it yourself. You don't need all 12. Uh, you know, stop patching, start replacing. There's no excuse today for running a patch on almost anything. You should just go ahead and get the updated image and propagate it through and avoid the manual drift. If you think about it, one of the primary places you get security exposures, what they call the APT threat, the advanced persistent threat. What happens is somebody breaches one of your VMs, they put in a rootkit, they put in some code, and they live there for the rest of your life while they go ahead and siphon off your data one bit at a time and say thank you very much. This is one of those cases where the rancher guys got it right. Cattle versus pets. Our VMs were pets. We named them, we patched them, we've had them running for years. Get out of that crap move on, get to where your stuff is short-lived because then the bad actor needs to get in and re-compromise you. If you're churning your images every month, you've now reduced the window to compromise to 30 days. If you're only reformatting your VMs once every five years, well, hell, I'm happy to get there once and stay. But if it's every 30 days, I'm going to go look for some sucker who hasn't moved yet because it's too much work for me to keep compromising your image every month or hopefully it's too much work. Uh, logging and monitoring need to be first class citizens. You really need to think about it up front. Um, I'm sure there's some cloud native vendors who will seek my card and bother me later. I will remind them that we are not cloud native. As I said, we're cloud immigrants. We run a lot of Oracle databases. We run a lot of stuff that will never go into a container. 
So we need to run stuff that can be both native and non-native. So we log to things like Splunk and we share that and our default Docker data center logging goes to Splunk as well as our other applications. So we get the benefit of having one answer but we don't have a cloud native answer because that won't work for us on the non-native parts where our persistence lives. Uh, monitoring, obviously, if you don't know it's down, you're in deep trouble, so it's best to know. Um, you know, don't over control. I know it sounds silly. I'm here from enterprise architecture. What do we do? We try to over control. I'm going to tell you, you can't do that. You need to get out there. You need to disrupt yourself. Uh, we have some innovation labs where we are doing greenfield work where we're trying to go ahead and obsolete our own software. We're hoping to eat our own lunch before one of you guys does. Um, you know, experiment. Play with Docker Enterprise, play with Kubernetes, play with, you know, Joint Triton, play with Mesos, play with whatever makes you happy and works for you. And then once you get there, then you can worry about standardization. The important part is getting into the container mindset and getting things encapsulated and isolated and exposed through APIs, because the APIs are really where you want to get to. And ADP has been doing a lot of work on getting to APIs. We have an API marketplace where we allow for third parties to build things that will enhance the ecosystem. So if any of you have a wild idea about how you can make our world better, developers.adp.com is a great place you can go and look at what's in our marketplace and what we expose to devs and how you can participate. If you think about it, if you take a monolithic application and you break it down, into microservices and you do it successfully, all you have is the same thing you started with, just slightly different. If you encapsulate the monolith and only evolve the pieces that matter away from the API you expose, you can be working on the new functionality and let the old function die over time. And I think you get a lot more lift from going that route than sitting here and saying, well, let's start by decomposing everything. Um, you know, recognize that the UI has become disposable. You know, look what's happened with our mobile phones, with your iPad, with your TiVo device, with whatever. The APIs are really the key to the functionality because the UI can be restacked and refactored and represented on whatever comes next. You know, Alexa, Echo, whatever. You know, the APIs will still work, but that old UI you got attached to and thought was so cool, that's going to be dead and buried. You know, if you don't want to bury the whole app, break it up, use the API separation, get your business logic where it belongs so it's truly reusable and truly scalable. Um, beyond that, I think that's pretty much all I had for you. Uh, hopefully it made some sense. Uh, I'm supposed to ask you to vote for my session as a favorite so I get to do this a second time on Thursday. I'm still a little confused as to how there's an upside for me doing this a second time. But, you know, if you guys would like to hear where I go next time, feel free to vote for the session and we'll give it a try. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, you can wander up to the microphone and uh, I'll try to answer it or I'll pull some sucker out of the audience to answer it. Otherwise, you can go to lunch and enjoy. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, this is Steve from Blockbridge. I was wondering if you could talk about your storage and how you're using storage today and maybe what is missing for you? Well, there's a lot missing from storage right now. That's what I was hoping to see this morning in the keynote was something on storage. Um, right now, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. We're still playing. Um, we're stuck in the world you're stuck in as well, dealing with uh, you know, NFS mounts and trying to figure out how we make this work at scale. Uh, generally, you'll hear me talk a lot about why we're cloud immigrants and we leave a lot of our persistent services outside of the container world and we primarily move our application servers and our web servers up into where we can safely put them with fully, you know, composed images and not worry quite as much. Uh, we've played with Flocker, we've played with other, some other, you know, vendor solutions, but I don't think we're there yet. And, uh, I keep hoping. I was really hoping this morning we were going to get the Nirvana storage announcement. But no such luck. As a follow up, sorry. As a follow up, what is your Nirvana solution then? <laughs> My Nirvana solution would be uh, storage that was actually aware of the container and could deal with the mapped namespaces. 
Um, I would love to see um, some kind of ubiquitous storage like a Joyant Manta or a, um, some other storage array, probably from IBM, knowing what we tend to buy. Um, that would present the storage in a coherent way that could be mounted uh, you know, in a similar um, immutable way, at least from an ownership point of view, even if it was read-write storage. Best I can do for you. Yes, sir. Yeah. How big the team you have to commit to make this transformation happen the, if you take the last two years uh, moving to Docker from your... Uh, uh, the team in terms of the workers or the talkers? Uh, it's a combination of both. So. We, we, we have a lot of talkers. We have, I think we probably have, what, six, five, six people who are actually the doers? And then we have about 20 that are the naysayers, 10 that are the defenders, and uh, five that are just jerks like me who keep saying, no, we're doing it, get over it. Um, I think that's really, you know, it, it doesn't take a lot of people. That's one of the benefits of going down a Docker Enterprise or a, a more baked stack. Uh, I'm sure if Pivotal were here, they could say they do it in two people because they're even more opinionated, but the, the right balance of opinionation seems to be, you know, somewhere in the five-person range. So, so you didn't have to dedicate, uh, you know, all the developers and the whole departments to make this transformation happen. That's what. No, I not not really. Oh, okay. um, and really, the the real key, I think, for us was the move toward APIs in general. As we moved toward APIs, the developers started to get it more and more, and they were playing with things like Vagrant and VirtualBox before. So, you know, Docker gave them a lot more freedom to do it more quickly, and they weren't waiting and taxing their machine to the point where it died. You know, they, they kept stacking so many VMs in there that they wondered why their laptop was dying, and we were wondering why we were buying, you know, four core machines for every developer. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, Booz Allen Hamilton, Girish Vardwani. I manage all our production applications, and the first battle that I lost with our enterprise architecture team was to bring in the cloud broker platform. I said, no, 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 many times over. I absolutely lost it. So as we are starting, we have the exact same problems that you have. Um, as we start this journey towards container, con using Docker, what is one thing that we should not do? What is one thing you should not do? Don't listen to your enterprise architecture team. That we have learned. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, that was a cheap shot, especially <laughs> since I am one of them. Um, I, I think the real key is that you have to go ahead and uh, get some freedom to experiment. You need to get a, a, a lab that will let you go ahead and play a little bit more. Because the mistake you're probably making is by telling them that this will do too many things for them. I, I've got into fights with our CIO over how this will revolutionize how we run and how this will make us so much more efficient and we'll never buy another CPU because we own enough CPUs already to run the world. And, and I got kicked back going, you don't understand our real problems. And Okay, maybe I don't. You need to go ahead and under-promise and over-deliver is really the key. And you need to just get that wedge in there so you can show that, you know, water does seek its own level. My hope is when we get this build pipeline built, that we're going to see a huge amount of backlog demand from devs start to run through this pipe because it's an easy way to get out. Yeah, but how do you do in an environment where developers don't even write a single line of testing code, you know? All our crap is manually tested. And like, nobody oh, does tests. A, a, a lot of our crap is manually tested too, and we're having to have a very long come to Jesus moment <laughs> about the why you need to do test-driven development. Yep. Um, one answer, which is, of course, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, is get better developers. Um, that's an option, yeah. But, but that, that's, a, that's a harsh option. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think if you can educate them on the fact that if they would just do a little bit more, they'd get a lot more out. You know, because a lot of the developers are really excited by having their function in the real world. And the more you can show them that there's an easier way to get there, and if they would just think a little bit more up front, that you'd be better off. The other option is to get your uh, manual testers up on Selenium, Cucumber, other test frameworks, and basically say, fine, he's not going to write it, you're going to write it. <laughs> Somehow you got to get to automation. Yep. I don't know. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. No silver bullets today. Yep. Yep. Uh, yes, sir. Two, two questions. First, a quick one. How many containers um, do you run on one host? 
Uh, right now, if you do simple math, uh, we're about eight containers per host. Okay. We're running about 28 swarms at the moment. Uh, we're still in a little bit of a funny space because we tend to have a, a cluster for you, a cluster for me, a cluster for Aunt Sue, and we haven't quite gotten all the way to trusting enough to let them all run in a truly elastic manner. Okay. Uh, I look forward to the day where we run one big one. Um, I think the guy who owns the infrastructure fears that day versus me who thinks it's going to be great. And the second question, thank you. Um, what do you use for networking you know, for your containers? Uh, generally speaking, we're using the overlay networking that is provided by Docker right now, uh, Interlock and the like. Um, we're still kind of having that fight as well because our classic networking team wants to uh, over-prescribe the IPs down to the container level and we're trying to get them to understand that in the new world where it's software-defined everything, you have to get over it and, and see that it works and stop being quite so micromanage -y. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we have time for one more. Okay, um, I'm Alvin from MariaDB over here. Oh, sorry. Um, so you said you're still trying to figure out persistence. Uh, so does this mean you're running your databases outside this infrastructure? That, that's what makes us cloud immigrants. We have these databases living outside, and I keep yelling at all the vendors that we need a dummy container definition so that I can expose my big Oracle rack to the container elastic layer and get to where the, at least the elastic part of the container landscape understands what this rock is that they're anchored to. Uh, we're not quite there yet. It's one of the challenges we are actively working. Um, but are you also working actively to get those databases running in containers? I, I'm not. We, we have them running in containers for our, some of our test flows. I do not foresee them going into containers anytime soon for production. A lot of our production databases are a little bit too big and beefy. Uh, the way we've built around our, our potting infrastructure and our clustering, we tend to go with very large, discrete clusters of Oracle or large, discrete clusters of, of SQL Server. And bringing those into a more distributed manner, you lose a little bit too much in the DB, uh, database administration area right now. I, 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 I hope we get there at some point, but I, I'm old and jaded. Thanks. One more? I'm Naga from Deloitte Consulting. Uh, I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, have you adopted anything like uh, shared libraries? Uh, did they work for you? And uh, second question is, what is the size of the image normally you build? What is the range? Of the image size? Correct. Oh, gosh. Our, our image sizes vary a lot. We've got a lot of folks trying to build back on Alpine to bring the image sizes down into the under 100 meg range. Uh, I keep busting chops that I want WebSphere in an image, which would be about two gigabytes. Uh, I have failed horribly on getting WebSphere containerized. Um, I guess that's a badge of honor. <laughs> um, in terms of shared libraries, we tend to have a, a, an inner source model where we're trying to share code more than libs. Um, we have a general pot problem, though, like most developers. My code is shareable, but yours is not. And they always seem to feel that way, no matter who wrote it. You know, my code's shareable, but, you know, your, your crap, no, I can't use your crap. So we, we do have inner sourcing. We have a lot of shared services, but we don't have a lot of shared code. I, if that helps at all. Yeah, um, maybe can I ask the third question? Go ahead. Uh, have you deployed more than one application in one image uh, on the same server like Undertow, Tomcat, or whatever it is? Uh, we have. We have, and, and it's generally okay. Uh, you want to make sure they're not too diverse and that they're more single-purposed. But there are many situations where we have dependencies on the apps where it's better to deploy them more together. So that, that has not been a real problem for us. Thank you. Thanks You're welcome. Uh, do I have one time for one more, Paul? You said we're only up against lunch. You're okay. yeah, go ahead. Sure, go ahead. Hi. So I have a question about cost, cost for Docker and if it helps to actually save money. <laughs> because everyone promised, like, you go to AWS, you save money. You go to Docker, you save money. You end up with huge bills and no money savings. Did you save money if you go to AW, Docker on AWS? Oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> um... 
I guess it depends where you're starting from. Uh, I believe that at ADP we can save a lot of money going to containers, mainly because we've already sunk a lot of the cost. I, I saw Werner Vogel talk years ago about how there can be no such thing as a private cloud, because he was arguing about the CapEx expense that goes into the public cloud. Uh, generally speaking, I do believe Docker can save you money, but I think that part of the trick is getting your devs to start thinking in a container mindset and start getting down to the APIs. Because if you think about um, 20 million lines of Linux code that you don't need, where you only need maybe you know, 1,000 of them, if you could stop spinning the, the clock for all that crap you're not using, you'd save money just there. So even without Docker, if you could get better about your dependency management on what your build looks like and go to a minimal uh, Linux, I think you'd find benefits even there because you could start to skinny your VMs and stack. Docker just makes that more intuitive and simpler to do. So I, I think there's no question that you can gain benefits. Okay. Last question also. So for when you run containers on one machine, you kind of end up with bigger failure domain. So if this machine goes down, multiple APIs goes down at the same time. Uh -huh. Have you seen such a problem? And, uh, no, because my operations folks are much too paranoid to let me run on one server. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if nobody else has a question, I think we'll call it done. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your day. Remember, vote. <laughs>